You can't do woodworking without clamps. That's a given. Well, you can, but it's pretty tedious sitting there and holding the wood together while you're waiting for the glue to cure. Clamps hold the wood together for you, but more importantly, they hold the wood together under pressure. Most common wood adhesives must cure under pressure in order to form a strong bond. Now, the exceptions to this rule are epoxy and hot melt glues. But with all others, the clamping pressure helps the glue to penetrate the wood surface and adhere to it. Under pressure, the glue joint itself, the glue line, is reduced to just a few thousandths of an inch or centimeter thick. What holds this joint together in this tiny little space is the cohesion of the glue itself. But on either side of the glue line, the clamping pressure forms the glue to penetrate a short distance into the wood, forming an interface. This is where all the adhesion takes place as the glue bonds to the wood fibers. As the glue, the adhesive, cures, it becomes one with the wooden parts, the adherents. And they all live together happily ever after thanks to the clamps. As you're well aware, there are over a zillion types of clamps available with three new ones being invented every minute. Fortunately, you don't need most of these. Just a few basic types will suffice. But before we talk about them, let's review the features that most of these clamps have in common. There is usually a frame of some sort that holds all the other parts. The C clamp, as you might guess, has a C shaped frame. The clamp usually has two jaws that squeeze the wood together. One or both of these may be movable. This particular clamp has a movable jaw and a fixed jaw that doesn't move. There is usually a screw that moves the movable jaws, applying pressure to the glue joint. And there is some sort of handle to turn that screw. The frame and the jaws enclose a space with two important dimensions. The distance between the jaws, when they are open as far as they will go, is the capacity. And if you draw a line between the jaws, the distance from that line to the frame is the throat. When I first started working wood, I didn't have a lot of money for commercial clamps. So I made my own. These are called violin clamps. And as simple as they are, they have all the same parts as this C-clamp. The wooden discs and the carriage bolt comprise the frame. One disc serves as a movable jaw, the other is fixed. The carriage bolts provide the screw with which to tighten the jaws. The handles are the wings of the wing nut, and the capacity is determined by the length of the carriage bolt and the throat by the diameter of the jaws. Despite all the ingenious ways there are to arrange these parts, most useful clamps fall into just five categories, which I will explain as we go. I will also suggest that you have at least a few clamps from each category in your mix. By far, the most common, the, sort of the vanilla flavored clamp of the woodworking world, is the C clamp, which I showed you earlier. The frame is usually made from cast iron, although I have seen them made from stamped steel. The movable jaw is usually round and mounted on a swivel so that it stays motionless as you tighten the screw. These come in a great many sizes, both capacity and throat. And you may want to keep a variety on hand to best suit the clamp to the job. Deep throat C clamps are especially versatile. These are one of the few clamps that you can use to put pressure in the middle of a wide assembly. Unfortunately, even the largest C clamps have a fairly limited capacity. So, most of us look to bar clamps when we need to extend our reach. These are actually fairly similar to C-clamps in that they have one fixed jaw and one movable jaw. But the frame is adjustable so that you can greatly extend the capacity. The bars themselves can be made in many different ways. Flat steel bars and iron pipes are the most common. But there are also U-channel bars, I-beams, and even wooden bars. Travis and I commonly use two types of bar clamps. For most of our assemblies, we use these flat steel bar clamps. In fact, days go by when we use nothing but the six inch and the 12 inch clamps. That's 
15 centimeters and 30 centimeters for those of you who think in metric. However, when we need more capacity, we move to the pipe clamps. The capacity of your average pipe clamp is truly unlimited. If you need more reach than the fixed length of pipe will allow, there are two things you can do. You can lap the fixed jaws of two pipe clamps over one another, sort of hooking them together, or you can use pipe couplings and additional pieces of pipe to extend the pipe as long as you need. When I last looked, my local lumberyard had a bin with 24 10-foot pipes in it. That's enough to assemble a pipe clamp with a 240-foot capacity, 73 meters. Now, presuming that every lumber yard within a two-hour drive of here had a similar inventory, Travis and I could assemble a pipe clamp with over a mile, 1.8 kilometer capacity. Now, I say that just in case there's a viewer out there with an irrational need to have a mention in the Guinness Book of World Records. Send us a photo. Although pipe clamps have a tremendous capacity, they have a very modest throat, as you can see. This one is barely one and a half inches, or just 3.8 centimeters. But you can fix that with these simple jigs. These are just pieces of construction lumber with holes drilled through the width ever so slightly larger than the pipe itself. I've also reinforced the end of the jig just below the hole with several screws. These will keep the extended jaws from splitting while I tighten the clamp. And one more thing about pipe clamps. If you have the type of clamp with a sliding handle like this, you can use them to unclamp as well as clamp. Simply turn the jaws around on the pipe and you will be able to pry things apart as well as press them together. The oldest wood clamp is the hand screw. And these are still extremely useful. They were once entirely made from wood, both the jaws and the screws. The newer types of hand screws still have wooden jaws, but they now have metal screws. These are sometimes called swivel nut hand screws for obvious reasons. You can get the jaws to pivot up to 30 degrees. This makes it possible to adjust the angle of the jaws, very handy for clamping odd shaped assemblies like the sleigh. Furthermore, the wooden jaws will not mar your assembly and they typically offer a much deeper throat than other clamps. They can also be used in a pinch as a makeshift vise. Use one hand screw to clamp another to your workbench and then clamp the work in the second hand screw. Very handy when you're at a work site away from your shop. They are very versatile, but hand screws can be a challenge to use. Since both jaws are movable, they require some patience to adjust. This simple procedure may help. Start with the jaws reasonably parallel, then open them up a little wider than you need. Close the jaws with the back screw only, making them a little narrower than you need at the back. Place the front screw against the assembly and tighten it down snug, but not too tight. Turn the back screw until the jaws make contact all along the surface of the assembly. Opening and closing the jaws can also be a test of your religion because no matter which way you want the jaws to move, when you first spin them, it'll always be the wrong way. Craftsmen who should know better tell me that if you get in the habit of picking up the hand screw with the forward screw in your right hand and the back screw in your left and then spin the clamp away from you, it will open. Spin it towards you and it will close. However, I know this to be an alternate fact with no actual relevance to workshop practice. These jaws will always move in the direction you least expect. That's a guarantee. I have been told that this may be because I don't know my right from my left. And while I did miss that day at kindergarten, my theory is these things are just ornery. Invaluable, but ornery. Band clamps sort of break the mold of what a clamp should be. There is no frame or jaws to speak of, just a woven band with a ratchet or a screw to tighten that band around an assembly. In essence, the entire band is a constricting jaw. 
Most commercial band clamps also come with 90 degree corners that make it easy to use the band clamps to glue up miter assemblies. This is my go-to clamp for picture frames and small boxes. But that's not its only use. Band clamps are also great for assemblies with multiple sides, no matter how many sides there may be. Pentagons, hexagons, octagons, triskaidecagons, that's 13 sides, can all be easily assembled with band clamps. You can even assemble part of a multi-sided assembly with a band clamp and a simple jig. This is 6 thirteenths of a triskaidecagon. You don't clamp up tridecagons every day, of course, or even octagons. But when you do, it's fantastic to have some band clamps around. You can even make your own from rope and stretchable materials. Rubber, latex, elastic, all are fantastic for clamping up odd shapes. If you're using rope, tie it loosely around the assembly with a square knot and use a stick or a dowel to twist it tight like you would a tourniquet. Or take a length of surgical tubing or bungee cord and wrap it around the assembly. The more you stretch the cord and the more wraps you make, the more you will increase the clamping pressure. However, I prefer a flat elastic clamp to round ones. A flat clamp has more contact area, so it better holds the wooden parts in alignment. It also seems to better conform to odd wooden shapes. I used to make my clamping straps by cutting strips from an old inner tube. These days, I just use rubber or latex exercise bands. Same thing, only in color. To use these flat elastic clamps, simply wrap them around the assembly, pulling them as tight as you can. On the last time around, tuck the free end of the band under the last wrap. And finally, every craftsman needs at least a few one-handed clamps that he can apply with one hand while he uses the other to align the wooden parts. These usually don't have screws because screw clamps require two hands, one to position and the other to turn the screw. Instead, they have ingenious mechanisms that allow you to position the clamp and tighten it with just one hand. The most common of these is the spring clamp. Squeeze to open, release to apply pressure. Locking jaw clamps are C clamps that operate like vice grip pliers. Simply squeeze the handle to lock the jaws on the work. Quick grip clamps or squeezy clamps are bar clamps with a handle and a trigger that advances the jaw each time you squeeze the trigger. And don't forget tape. You just can't assemble a triskaidecagon without tape. Now, oftentimes these things are just temporary, something to hold the parts in alignment and together until you can bring the screws in and apply serious pressure. But that doesn't mean they're not an important part of your assembly procedure. Oftentimes, these spell the difference between success and a complete mental breakdown. Having a few clamps from each of those five categories, C clamps, bar clamps, hand screws, band clamps, and one-handed clamps, can provide a functional clamping mix with the versatility you need to take on most clamping challenges. However, those aren't the only clamping tools you'll need. There are some important clamping accessories, most of which you can make yourself, that can become an important part of your mix. Calls, C-A-U-L-S, are absolutely essential whenever you're using a clamp with metal jaws. These are just scraps of wood that you put between the metal jaws and the wooden surface to prevent dents. Larger, thicker calls can also help spread the clamping pressure out over a wider area. Some clamps come with plastic calls that fit over your jaws like this. However, these are prime targets for the shop gnomes that steal your pencils and your glue caps. So I keep a can of hardwood coals on hand for whenever I assemble projects. They are a pain to hold them in place when you tighten the clamps. But you can use double-sided tape to temporarily stick a call to a clamp jaw, or shoe goo to permanently attach it. Also, wax your coals. Apply a little wax to the entire surface. This will prevent them from sticking to your glue-ups. Corner squares. They hold two pieces of wood at right angles to one another. Actually, they do the same job as miter clamps, but they're much more versatile and less expensive to make. There are several ways to make corner squares. You can cut plywood shapes and then glue clamping ledges to them, or just drill holes in them 
and fasten them to the assembly with C-clamps. They can be any size or shape that you need, and they don't necessarily have to have 90 degree corners. They can have 60 degree corners for a hexagon, 45 degree corners for a uh, octagon, and if you're making a triskaidecagon, you'll need 27.69 degree corners and a really good angle finder. If you're making jigs and fixtures to secure the work as you cut it or shape it, toggle clamps will help make the operation safer, more accurate, and easier to repeat. There are many different designs, so when you're choosing one, make sure that it not only holds the wood, but keeps itself out of the way of the cutters and the shapers. You can also use simple wedges to secure wood and jigs. This is a jig that Travis and I designed to glue up wooden triangles into discs, like the pieces of a pie. Just beyond each triangle is a dowel that serves as a fixed jaw in this clamping operation. Insert each wedge between the dowel and the work to apply the clamping pressure. A pressure bar is a length of hardwood with at least one gently curved surface. This is to apply pressure in the middle of a wide assembly when you clamp down the ends. Now, if I were to clamp the flat surface at the ends, there would be almost no pressure, if any at all, at the middle. But the curved surface of the pressure bar applies pressure at the middle the minute you tighten the clamps. With a little practice, you can achieve a reasonably even pressure all across the surface of a wide assembly. How much curve should a pressure bar have? Well, that depends on the length of the bar and the pressure you need. This bar has maybe half an inch, three quarters of an inch of rise here. When I press it down on both sides, that pressure will be spread out over a long bar, so the pressure will be fairly gentle. This short bar has about the same rise, but it'll apply a lot more pressure when I clamp it down at both ends. I would start with about a half inch rise, 13 millimeters, and then go up or down from there until you find what you need. Finally, an assembly table speeds up most clamping tasks. This is nothing more than a flat, true surface with two straight fences square to one another. Slots and holes allow you to attach clamps wherever you need them. The torsion box surface keeps the assemblies dead flat, and the fences keep them straight and square. I cover the design and the use of this assembly table in another video. The link to that video is at the end of this one, and we're not far off. It's a deceptively simple idea, but once you've used it for a few assemblies, you'll be amazed at just how versatile and effective this simple idea is. The plans for the assembly table are available at the Workshop Companion General Store, along with the plans for the clamp caddy that you've been watching over my shoulder. And we have videos on both of these too, at where else? The Workshop Companion channel. You can also find my book on gluing and clamping, and this has over a dozen plans for uh, clamps and clamping accessories that you can make yourself. Now we've bundled this book along with the two plans I just mentioned, so you buy the book, you get the plans free. The links are in the video description. And once again, thank you for your kind attention.